Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, our UDI Okanagan event. Looks like we've got a uh, number of participants here and everyone's been able to trickle in, so it's good to see. Um, so today for, for this UDI Okanagan conference call, we've titled this The Economic and Financial Outlook Admits the COVID-19 Crisis with Doug Porter. Uh, it's very, very great to have Doug here with us today. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Luke Turi, and I'm the Vice Chair of UDI Okanagan. And I'm also Executive Vice President with Mission Group. Uh, before we get to our main event, we just want to let you know again that during this COVID-19 crisis, UDI Okanagan is committed to getting practical and relevant information to you as best that we can. So uh, we have been and we will continue to be sending out COVID-19 updates to our members. And uh, there is a COVID-19 resource page that's available on our website, which is udiokanagan.ca. So please stay tuned for further updates in the near future regarding new events and initiatives as we continue to provide value to our members during this time. Uh, as far as the format goes today, uh, most of this event is going to be a question and answer period. So uh, I would encourage any of the attendees to use the chat function um, in, uh, in Zoom here to start populating some questions for Doug. Uh, I'm sure you all have lots of thoughts on, uh, on the status of the economy at this point. And I also just wanted to flag as well that slides will be available. So Doug has prepared a number of slides for us here. We won't have time to go through all of them today but we will send out uh, the slides as, long, uh, as well as a, uh, a recording of this session uh, that you can view after or, or share with others. So now to our speaker, and uh, certainly on behalf of UDI, we'd really like to thank Doug for taking time out of his busy schedule to do this. Douglas Porter is the Chief Economist and Managing Director of BMO. He has over 25 years of experience analyzing global economies and financial markets. As Chief Economist at BMO Financial Group, he oversees the macroeconomic and financial market forecasts and co-authors the firm's weekly flagship publication, Focus. Mr. Porter manages the team that won the prestigious Lawrence Klein Award for Forecast Accuracy of the U.S. Economy and was named by Bloomberg as top Canadian forecaster. As a respected commentator on economic and financial trends, he is regularly quoted in the national press and often interviewed on radio and television, not to mention UDI conference calls as well. So uh, once again, Doug, really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I know that uh, you're quite a busy guy these days, but I'll hand things over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Luke, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks to UDI for, uh, for inviting me. I know I was supposed to be in Kelowna today. Uh, didn't quite make it, of course, for obvious reasons, but uh, hopefully this uh, this will be a near substitute. As Luke mentioned, uh, we do, I, I did include a, a slide deck in uh, in today's presentation. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to go through every one, but uh, over the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so, I'd, I'll, I'll basically uh, just give you some of the highlights of where we see the economy. Eff uh, effectively, what I'm going to I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but just in, in terms of, uh, of of what we're looking at uh, for this year, uh, some of the implications, how we're going to pay for uh, what we're going through uh, this year, and then maybe look out um, into 2021 and 2022 in, in terms of what we can expect uh, for uh, for the broader economy. And I'll talk a little bit about the BC economy as, as well. Um, just from a very big picture view, you know, obviously, you've probably heard the uh, the phrase unprecedented more times than you want to hear, but there's uh, just no doubt about it that what we're looking at uh, this year is really nothing like we've seen um, in, in not just in the post-war era, but arguably even in the, in the last hundred years. Um, I'll, I'll start off and just ask Luke to uh, to take us to, to global GDP slide. That's uh, that would be page five. Uh, just to put in perspective, um, we and the IMF are looking for a decline in the global economy on the order of about 3% this, uh, this year. A normal year for the global economy would be growth of somewhere, say, between 3 to 3.5%. Three uh, so that just gives you a sense of how unusual this, uh, this year is. Even 2009, which was one of the worst years in recent decades for the global economy, uh, it barely fell. That year, you know, it uh, depending on how you measure it, it was down by about one to two tenths. So a three percent decline is uh, literally off the charts. 
in terms of the, the post-war experience for the global economy. And I think what really stands out here is just how broadly based uh, this decline is, is likely to be. Uh, if you can see it down the right-hand column, we've got our estimate of, uh, of a number of economies for, uh, for this year. And, and I think the main message there is everyone is being affected by this. I mean, we're you know, seeing uh, de declines right across Europe, Japan, um, emerging markets are going from, you know, in China and India, from trend growth rates of six or seven percent down to maybe zero, one, two percent growth. So pretty much every economy in the in the world is uh, is being affected. Now, Luke, if we can just turn to the uh, the next uh, chart on uh, page six on North American growth uh, to bring it a little bit closer to home. Um, and just to put these numbers into perspective, I would say we're not especially optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, this is pretty close to the conventional wisdom, such as there is a conventional wisdom these days. I would say, if anything, we're maybe a little bit less pessimistic than some others are. Um, but in a nutshell, we see about a 5% decline in the U.S. economy this year and about a 6% decline in the Canadian economy, both of which we think will be more or less reversed next year. But just to put that in perspective, if you get a 5% drop in the U.S. this year and a 5% bounce next year, well, you're not quite back to 100%. And, of course, there's population growth over that period of time. So, effectively, the economy is still well below uh, its trend level, its underlying trend, even when you get out into the end of 2021 under this forecast. And, frankly, we're probably, as I said, just a little bit more upbeat on the economy's prospects for, uh, for 2021 than others. Uh, a lot of other forecasters don't quite have as much of a bounce in the economy as, as we do. Uh, the main reasons why we're a little bit more upbeat in terms of uh, the, the growth coming back, first of all, we've been impressed by just the wave of government and policy actions that we've seen unwield, uh, unwield in, in the last couple months. Um, you know, just as the downdraft is unprecedented, so too has been the policy response, whether it's been on the monetary policy front, you know, interest rate cuts, uh, so-called quantitative easing, or on the fiscal side, you know, the raft of government measures we've seen that are still being wheeled out to this day, um, we think almost one for one have offset some of the tremendous income losses that, uh, that we've uh, been dealing with over, over the last couple of months. And we think that will put consumers in, the, in a situation where they can start to uh, slowly but surely come back through the second half of this year and then a little bit more forcefully in, uh, in 2021. But to put those, uh, those numbers into perspective, that 6% decline in Canada, that 5% decline in the U.S., both of those are more than double or roughly double the wor worst prior declines that we've seen in either economy. So th in the post-war era, the worst single year for the Canadian economy was 1982, when it fell by a bit more than 3%. The worst year for the U.S. economy was 2009, when it fell by about 2.5%. So these declines, as I said, are, are simply unprecedented um, in the, in the post-war era. Uh, now, if we could turn to the, uh, the, the very next chart, just breaking down you know, how we see it provincially. I was actually asked by an institutional investor today whether you know, different provinces might do fair differently because we've had such different um, experiences with, uh, with COVID. I mean, some provinces like Quebec are, have been hit much, much harder than others. Uh, some provinces have gotten off quite lightly. Uh, if you saw the national news last night, uh, they pointed out New Brunswick has not had a single death. They haven't had a new case in, in, in days in, in that province. But, you know, even though we've had very different experiences with the virus, we've all been shut down to some extent. And the economic pain has been pretty much similar across the country. We do see the three oil producers being hit the hardest. Uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland will, uh, will go through the biggest downdraft. We've got BC falling by a little bit less than the rest of the country. Uh, we would be a bit more upbeat on BC in terms of its rebound next year. We think BC is in better fiscal position. It, of course, it's not an energy exporter, not an oil exporter. Um, it also was a little less, a, a little less affected than uh, Quebec or Ontario by the, by the virus. So, and and we just happen to believe that Ontario has got, uh, I'm sorry, BC's got better underlying uh, fundamentals than uh, than most of the rest of the country. So we would, uh, we would see BC probably coming back at the margin a, a little bit stronger than the uh, the rest of the uh, the country. Um, we are going. If we turn to the next slide, just on unemployment rates. Of course, this has been. Uh, one area that's uh, been very much in, in the headlines. We do get uh, the, uh, the news on April jobs next Friday in both Canada and the U.S. We think 
uh, this this is going to be you know these are just going to be horrific reports. You know our, our our estimate is that Canadian employment after dropping by a million in March, uh, the the reading might be as as much as four to five million more jobs reportedly lost. I mean we've we've seen the reports about the number of people who are on the Canadian emergency. Uh, response benefit, you know, more than 7 million people are getting it. If if you believe that each and every one of those persons or people on uh, on the CERB have, have lost their job, well, that's that's almost 35% of uh, of Canada's workforce. I, I actually think that does overstate um, uh, the, the number of job losses we've had. I think some people are probably getting the CERB who aren't actually eligible and uh, th- th- those numbers will ultimately come down. But it gives you a sense of you know, just how many people have been affected by that and how much uh, government spending is, uh, is being directed to, uh, to support this. And that brings me to my next topic, if we can just turn to the, uh, the next slide on uh, Canadian government deficits. And I have to say, this is probably one area where we're getting more uh, questions and more concerns than, than any other. And effectively, it boils down to, well, how can we pay for this? You know, we, our, our best estimate at this point is that Ottawa is probably looking at a budget deficit north of $200 billion this year. Uh, the point estimate at this point is running at about $215 billion. Uh, prior to the virus, prior to the crisis, we were looking at a budget deficit of below $30 billion. So it gives you a sense of just to what extent uh, this has deteriorated. Uh, some of it is due to just the, the revenue loss from uh, from the economic destruction, but more of it is due to the the variety of measures that they've wheeled out. You know, the CERB or the wage subsidy program. Uh, we calculate that uh, new direct spending measures have tallied about 150 billion, and they're probably not done there yet. You know, a lot a lot really does depend on how long the shutdowns last. But effectively, what they've set aside um, in terms of income support and wage support will take us to about the middle of June and really not much longer, not much more beyond that. Um, so if the shutdowns really do continue to extend through the summer uh, for whatever reason, uh, then then we're going to see even more fiscal cost. Um, we're not the only ones going through this. Um, almost every major economy in the world is facing a very large budget deficit. Um, a few points I would make is, first of all, in some ways we were lucky, and I know it sounds bizarre to talk about being lucky, uh, but we were lucky that this happened when it did, when real interest rates were negative, when long-term borrowing costs were extremely low. Had this happened, say, in the 80s or the 90s or even the 2000s, we would have been in an incredibly tough situation when, uh, when interest rates were much, much higher. But as we speak, uh, the government of Canada can borrow money for 10 years, for about 0.6%. So, and I've made this point often, if, if you think about that extra $200 billion of, of borrowing they're likely to do this year, well, they're only paying 0.6% on that. Um, so that, you know, the net new interest cost of that per year is somewhere between one and one and a half billion dollars. Now that's not nothing, but it's relatively modest and, and it's quite affordable. The other point to make is that for the first time ever, the Bank of Canada has embarked on this so-called quantitative easing where they're actually out there buying government bonds, just putting it on their balance sheet. It, yes, not to put too fine a point on it, effectively printing money. Uh, they're buying uh, um, at least $5 billion of Government of Canada bonds each and every week. So if that goes on for a year, they'll buy $260 billion at least of government bonds. So for all intents and purposes, the Bank of Canada is bankrolling this increase in the budget deficit. They've also just recently announced they're going to buy $50 billion worth of provincial bonds. And it just so happens that we estimate that the combined provincial budget deficits will rise by about $50 billion this year. So effectively, the Bank of Canada is taking on all this new debt. So all those increased interest payments are going to the Bank of Canada, not to foreign investors, not to average investors. It's essentially going on the Bank of Canada's books. Now, how long can that go on? I don't think it can go on that long. Uh, that that can probably be managed for about a year before you start risking things like inflation, and that brings me to another point. And I actually do have a chart on uh, on inflation on uh, page 14. Um, uh, this is probably the other question we get asked more than any other: is you know, is there a risk that you know the end result of all this will be an outbreak of inflation because of all this uh, money printing, quantitative easing, big budget deficits that we're running? And and I know it seems very Strange to be talking about the risk of inflation when you know we just had negative int- or negative uh, oil prices last week for a day, 
and you know we've got exceptionally low commodity prices. But there is there is a slight tail risk that if the Bank of Canada just gets us wrong, if investors lose faith in the Canadian dollar, that if this uh, quantitative easing experiment you know goes on too long, there there is a slight risk that uh, you know one of the end results of this is inflation. I don't. I don't really worry about it that much. I, w- I would have put the odds of that before the vi- virus happening is uh, next to nil. Um, but the extreme risks have risen as a result of this highly, highly unusual event. So I do not dismiss inflation risks out of hand. I do think they're, as I said, I think they're a tail risk. It's not, uh, it's not the biggest thing I'm concerned about. I'm more concerned about being left with very low inflation after all this is 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 done just because uh, you know we're going to end up with an unemployment rate around the world higher than it was before the virus happened. Um, but it's it's again it's not something I can completely dismiss. Um, just in terms of the uh, the prepared remarks, uh, I'd, I'd like to go on to a couple slides right near the uh, the back. If we could uh, just turn to uh, to slide 17, it talks. This this goes back to a report that our group put out a couple of weeks ago and. You know, I, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, there's no way we can recover because, you know, there's a lot of areas that, you know, we're ne- are never going to get back to normal. Things like restaurants and, and travel and, and that sort of thing, you know, we're, we're never going to fully recover. Well, that, I, I would say that, yes, we're, we're going to have a different economy a, a year out and maybe even two years out than what we're dealing with right now. But that doesn't mean that we can't recover. It just means that, you know, some areas are going to have to grow faster or take up a bigger share of the, of the economy. And we we went through, uh, it was about an eight-page report. It's on our uh, website if you're interested. And it's basically, uh, it's called Post-Pandemic uh, Economy Building a Bridge. And we, we looked at a number of areas that, you know, can see uh, better than normal growth that uh, that might step into the void to, to some extent. And I've, I've listed some of them there. Some of them are intuitive. You know, some of them are, are already in place. You know, whether it's, it's e-commerce or you know, every, everything related to, to working from home or mobile working. Uh, we also think robotics are going to get a big lift uh, from this as well. Um, as, as I said, it's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, basically um, intuitive things that, and, and trends that were already in place that we think have just simply been brought forward. It's almost like the future has been brought into the present uh, by this very dramatic uh, uh, event. And I, I think our main message is that, you um, yeah, there are going to be areas that are going to be depressed and constrained, but there are a lot of other areas that might step into the void in, in a bit. And so I would push back on some of the extreme negativity. Now, having said that, if we flip to the next page, a, a companion piece we put out last week is, well, let's let's look at just how big of a share of the economy are some of the areas that will remain constrained. Because obviously, there's no going back to, to normal for quite a while in in a number of areas, things like air travel, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, sports and entertainment, you know, let's face it, we're not going to get back to, to normal anytime soon in those areas. And so what we did is we went through in both Canada and the U.S. and toted up, well, how much of the, the economy do those sectors directly account for? And in Canada, it's about 3.5% of our economy. In the U.S., each and every one of those sectors is actually bigger than it is in Canada, and it accounts for about 4.5% of the U.S. economy. And, you know, we think, roughly speaking, those those sectors will will be operating maybe at 50 to 60 percent of capacity even even a year out um, until people feel much more comfortable um, or or there's a very effective vaccine in place uh, that those sectors will be, still be constrained. So that's that gives you an order a, a general sense of the order of magnitude that we're talking about in in the economy that uh, that will remain constrained. We think even uh, even a year out. Um, I see I've spoken for a little bit more than 15 minutes, so I'll I'll, I'll just leave it there, Luke. If uh, um, you know, as I said, there's lots of other detail in that uh, in in that piece, but uh, I'll, I'll hand it back to you if there are uh, some specific issues or themes you'd uh, you'd like to me to go into a little bit more. That's great. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, I guess now uh, appreciate your your prepared comments there. And of course, I just wanted to remind everyone, maybe those that uh, joined the call a little bit late, uh, is that the slides that, that he's uh, prepared from BMO here will be available to all the membership. So no need to have worried about uh, taking notes or screenshots or anything like that. Um, and we're moving into the Q&A section. And so uh, we have had some questions that have been uh, s- submitted in, in advance, but 
Uh, we also have the opportunity to use the, uh, the chat here. There's a Q&A section uh, in, your, in your Zoom panel there, uh, or I'll, I'll try and pick them up in the, in the open chat as well. So um, time, to, uh, time to put you uh, on the hot seat here a little bit. I'm sure uh, nothing new for you, but obviously these are interesting times and uh, really appreciated the insights uh, in at the start of your presentation there. So. Um, Go with the uh, first question here, which is uh, you spoke to kind of a little bit, but um, you know, they, they, I'll just read the question out. But the, the economies of the Western world have been reliant on deficit government spending for the past few decades. Now with the COVID-19 spending, governments will no longer be able to maintain those deficits and will need to start paying back its debt. How will the economies of the Western world manage? And I know you touched on the, the cost of some of that debt, but do you have any other thoughts on that? And let's let's look at uh, Ottawa's finances to to start with, and I think it's important, um, you know, as as the government is very fond of pointing out, uh, pointing out that relative to other major economies, Canada did come in this in relatively good shape. It, in an ideal world, you know, and I I had been saying this for years, we should have been keeping our powder dry and preparing for rainy weather. Little did I know we were going to get hit, hit with the uh, the biggest monsoon ever. Um, but, you know, it's a bit unfortunate that we weren't in an even stronger uh, position coming into this. But that aside, Ottawa, Ottawa's uh, debt to GDP ratio was about 30%. Um, if we go to the bad old days in, uh, in the mid 1990s, it was closer to 70%. Um, now, running a budget deficit of 10 to 15% of uh, the economy this year will we'll, we'll bring that debt to GDP ratio up, but we're still going to be well below the kind of levels that we were back in the, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s. And, you know, back in the 90s, we were still paying 6 7 8% on our debt. Now we're paying, as I said, less than 1%. So, you know, even, even if our debt ratios got back to where they were in the 90s, it'd be much, much more manageable than it was uh, back, back in those days when uh, real interest rates were much higher. So, as I said, in, in a way, we were lucky that this happened when it, when it didn't, did, and it didn't happen in, in a period when we had to pay uh, big positive interest rates. Um, the question said, you know, how are we going to pay down these debts? Uh, the reality is we're not. You know, uh, uh, Ottawa's debt has almost never fallen. It's, uh, it's, sometimes it's stable. You know, sometimes it rises very quickly, sometimes it rises slowly, but over time it, it, it rises. Um, but so too does the economy, and, uh, you know, that's a luxury we have when, you know, when, when we've got a growing population, which we presumably still will uh, in, in years afterwards. Um, and so, uh, you know, provided the, uh, the, the deficit to GDP starts to come down in the next few years as the economy recovers, I, I, again, I do think it's manageable, especially given where, where interest rates are today. Now, that's a little less true in some other economies, like, the, like Europe, like the U.S. They did not come into this in nearly as strong a situation as Canada did. And they're going to be under a little bit more pressure to start to bring those deficits down when the, when the economy does begin to recover. But that's, that's definitely a concern more, I would say, for 2021 and 2022 in those economies. Uh, I do think it's a bigger issue in Europe than it is in uh, in the U.S. Um, but again, I, th I, th I think that's a concern for uh, for next year and, and beyond. The other the other point I make out is uh, or make is that uh, Europe really hasn't done that much yet in terms of fiscal spending. North America has been a lot lot more aggressive uh, than uh, than Europe has, and that that's because they are in a tougher uh, budgetary situation and just you know haven't haven't been able to respond. To the same extent. So the flip side of that is Europe's probably not going to have as strong a recovery as we're likely to see here in North America next year. Uh, well, so maybe I'll take a related question. So still on kind of def deficit spending and, uh, you know, maybe the first question being, you know, where is the stimulus funds coming from? I know you kind of referenced the fact that it's essentially uh, printing money in terms of buying bonds, but is, is, there, is there also debt associated with that? And then the, the follow-up question would be, you know, where is it coming from, but what effect will, will uh, either uh, types of stimulus have on um, the dollar or interest rates or inflation, which you touched on as well? Yeah, and on, uh, on, on the dollar, um, again, the thing to point out is we're, we're all in this, you know, to varying degrees, pretty much every government in the, in the world is, is having to uh, to spend a lot more money and, and run up budget deficits. So, 
you know, from a, from a currency standpoint, I wouldn't say it's a wash, but, um, you know, e- everyone is basically uh, being dragged down together by this. And, and, you know, always keep in mind that currencies are just relative prices uh, versus each other. I, 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 I do I do buy into the argument that uh, you know one one of the winners from this uh, potentially longer term, uh, but certainly over the uh, over the near term is gold. I do I do buy into that uh, that that view. I do think it's reasonable if you know for investors to to take a long hard look at uh, at gold. Um, but uh, I, you know the way I would see the Canadian dollar is if if we. You know, if we did more, if we ran an uh, you know an even bigger budget deficit than than other countries uh, as as a share of our economy, you know, if our economy was being hit harder than others, then I might be a bit concerned about the Canadian dollar. But I don't I don't think that's directly true. Uh, my bigger concern about the Canadian dollar is where oil prices are. Um, so far, we've gotten a bit of a pass on that front, and I have to say that's been I think a shock to a lot of us is how well the Canadian dollar has hung in there. In the last uh, the last month or so, given what oil prices have done, um, I, th- I I would put that down to the view that you know financial markets in general have recovered nicely in the in the last month, um, and the Canadian dollar has been caught up in that. And I also do think that uh, uh, currency markets are not looking at today's prices or even the one month prices; they're looking at oil prices a year down the road, and do believe there'd be a bit of a recovery. But if that proves incorrect, and if oil prices are still in the teens or even in the low twenties. You know, six months from now, I think the Canadian dollar weakens further. Um, our core view is that the Canadian dollar is likely to soften somewhat over the next three to four months, stabilize, and then and then repair slightly over the next year. But I would not say we're particularly optimistic on on the Canadian dollar, especially not with where oil prices are. Um, you know, where where the stimulus funds coming from? Well, you know, as as I said, basically they're. Uh, they, uh, the, the government debt levels are rising quite a bit. Uh, it's, it's the Bank of Canada that's essentially buying up uh, this, this new onslaught of bonds, at, uh, at, at, at least at this point. Um, you mentioned just quickly, maybe we'll just touch on oil. So uh, your thoughts on whether or not oil would be making a comeback, or is this more of a, a long-term trend that we'd be looking at for the Canadian oil industry as a whole? So the one the one thing about the oil market, as economists like to say, is it's very inelastic. So if you have even a slight mismatch between supply and demand, you get a you know you get a bit of a shock move in either supply or demand. You can get a very dramatic increase in in prices. Um, and we've we've had something much much bigger than a slight move in demand. We've had a demand shock like the likes of which we've never seen before. You know, effectively. You know, half the world stopped driving. Uh, you know, much of the world stopped flying. Uh, over overnight, you know, we had this just dramatic seizing up in in the demand for oil. And uh, you know, as as some of the uh, the shutdowns lighten up, as people begin driving a little bit more, we'll see some of that demand come back. But we're we're still probably looking at uh, demand destruction on the order of about 10% this year. Uh, again, the likes of which we've never seen before. Um, now. To their credit, uh, the the supply agreement reached uh, just a couple of weeks ago by OPEC and uh, and Russia, and to some extent even the U.S. did call for dramatic cuts in in production. But that's exactly what we need at uh, at, at this point, just to stabilize prices. Um, we we do, we do think that's enough to you know to bring prices back a little bit in the second half of the year. But we're looking at an average. Uh, but WTI price in the second quarter of this year below 20, and for the year as a whole of about $30. And just as a reminder, uh, you know that's that's well below where we were last year. Last year's average price was uh, was just shy of $60. So, you know, e- even with uh, you know a bit of a comeback in the second half of the year, we're still about half of where we were over the last uh, the last couple of years. Um, we we believe OPEC will will you know still keep a very tight uh, rain on on the taps in uh, in in 2021, and we've got uh, prices coming back a little bit, uh, but even then we've uh, we, we we see them averaging just uh, around forty dollars or, or so, even in uh, in 2021, even as as the economy has uh, has recovered and begun to recover in a meaningful way, and that's again just because uh, even with a recovery, you're still going to have a bit of a mismatch uh, between where uh, where demand is and where supply was before. Uh, the crisis began. Makes sense. Uh, I want to go back to a uh, 
phrase you had uh, a few minutes ago uh, that we're all in it together. And I, and I wonder, you know, as it relates to kind of our, the globalization trend of the past several decades and wondering if you have any thoughts on, you know, our, the need for us to be creating newer, you know, new models for economic growth is, is globalization dead? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's dead, but it's, it's pretty heavily wounded. And, you know, I think you can make a pretty good case that it was already going into reverse to some extent, um, even before uh, COVID, lar largely because of the, uh, the intense trade war between the U.S. and, and China. And, let's, and in the good old days of last year, that was, uh, that was still the biggest economic story out there. Uh, you know, they, they had, just as a reminder, they had actually re reached a truce uh, around the turn of the year, which we thought uh, was, was going to put this year on, uh, on a better, better footing. But uh, make no mistake about it, it was just a truce, and it was in both sides' interests you know, to be in that truce uh, ahead of the 2020 election. Um, but, you know, and, and, and there I think it, it, it depends somewhat on, on who wins the U.S. election uh, later, later this year. But, uh, you know, even, even if it is uh, Biden who, who wins, uh, I'm, I'm not sure things really reverse. Keep, it, keep in mind the Democrats historically have been more protectionist than, than the Republicans. Trump, well, in many ways is, is an aberration, but, um, but, but definitely – you know, him taking the Republican Party to the protectionist side of the camp is extremely unusual, to, to say the least. And I think that was already beginning to turn the, uh, the clock back on, uh, on globalization. I think, you know, some of the issues with uh, relying on sources uh, in China for medical supplies and, you know, in China and India for, for prescription medications, uh, you know, that's, that's really been exposed uh, by, by this, uh, this trauma or by this crisis. And I wouldn't at all be surprised if we have mandated, you know, production in 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 North America for for medical supplies, for pharmaceutical, for certain pharmaceuticals, as a result of this. Um, you know, I'm not here to say supply chains are going to completely shorten, but I think I think companies are going to take a long, long look at them, and maybe look at uh, at at building in a, a, a little bit more fail-safe mechanisms and you know look at ways to to shorten or se secure those supply chains. Now that might actually somewhat support manufacturing in North America. I don't, I don't think we're looking at wholesale changes, um, but I think at the margin you will, you will see a bit more onshoring of, of production in, in North America, or at the very least in the, in the Mexico. Now, the flip side of that is it raises costs. Um, you know, the last, arguably the last 20 years have been like a wonderland for, uh, for North American consumers. Uh, inflation's been incredibly low, inc incredibly restrained, even with you know what had been one of the tightest job markets we'd ever seen before this uh, before this crisis. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's going to continue after this. I, th I think you know we're probably looking at somewhat constrained profit margins, and we're probably looking at a, at least at the margin somewhat uh, somewhat higher pricing um, for for at least for some goods um, in in the years ahead as uh, as supply chains are somewhat brought back into uh, in North America. Mm. Yeah, I mean, those, those sort of global trends would be very interesting to watch over the coming years. Um, before we get into maybe a, a few questions a little bit more pointed to uh, BC and, uh, you know, more direct impacts to uh, real estate and real estate financing, I um, wanted to ask, so in your, in your presentation and the assumptions that you're making at this point, are you assuming a double spike in the virus uh, and a double dip in equity markets? Question from Andrew Gauthier. So officially, we we don't call the equity market in the uh, in the economics department. Um, all I will say is, I, I would say the rebound in equities and financial markets in general, it has not been driven by fundamentals. It's been driven by the wave of liquidity uh, that the Fed and other central banks have offered. Um, I do think the markets have somewhat built in. I, I don't want to quite say a V-shaped recovery, but I think they've they've built in a pretty quick recovery by by the economy, and it's definitely vulnerable to disappointment. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you what path the virus is, is going to take in, in the months ahead, but I, w I would say financial markets are susceptible to, you know, to a serious relapse. We don't know, we don't even know how policymakers would re respond uh, to that, you know, whether they would necessarily shut down the economy again completely or try to. Um, I, I, I don't think they can afford to do a full shutdown again. Um, but but it is it is a risk, um, and and that would certainly be very bad news for uh, for the equity market. I, I 
I, I think probably more what we're dealing with is, you know, a series of stop, stop starts over over the next year. I, I don't believe, as I said, we're going to go through another uh, full-on shutdown right across the board. But you can see, you know, they're going to. Oh, I, I think things will be opened up very gingerly, and they'll be ready to, you know, put in some new restrictions again. That you know, the first sign that uh, that the virus is uh, is is starting to to pick back up again. So I, th- I think it's going to be a bit of a rocky recovery over over the next year, where we do you know, have some, at least some temporary setbacks. And, and I think likewise, the financial markets are, 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 you know, it's not going to be a nice smooth comeback over, over the next year. And in, in terms of financial markets as either, either they're going to go through their uh, bouts of toggling between optimism and, and pessimism as well. And just to give you a sense of how far back the equity markets had come before today, uh, I was pointing out yesterday that the S and P 500, uh, was was basically back yesterday to where it stood a year ago, um, you know. So so in, and and it was almost flat on on a year to date basis or basis or at least the the Nasdaq was. Uh, to me, that makes no sense. Um, you know, for the equity market to be back where it was a year ago, or for the Nasdaq to be back to where it was at the start of the year. Um, you know, the economic environment it is just too uncertainty. You know, we we don't even know that we've hit bottom yet. Um, in, in terms of output, we don't know how long we're going to scrape along uh, this this bottom before things turn. And, and you know, to the questioner's point, you know, we don't know if we're going to face a relapse, a, a serious relapse, sometime later this year. So, you know, all, all I would say is I, I would be extremely cautious on the equity market over over the next uh, the next year. Yes, the the charts have been volatile to say the least. Um, so let, let's move uh, let's move into uh, some questions about BC more specifically, and a question around um, how you might see BC being poised to recover in comparison to the rest of Canada. So as I as I briefly touched on in, in my comments, and just to to stress again, well, first of all, I think every single province in the country you know, is, is facing a pretty serious downturn this year, and every single province will see some kind of a recovery next year. Uh, by far and away, the hardest hit are, are the oil producers. I, I think compared to, you know, what's, what's likely to befall Alberta and Saskatchewan and, and Newfoundland for somewhat different reasons, you know, is, is a different order of magnitude than what we're facing in the rest of the country. I think on, on balance, as, as I said, BC and probably a couple of the Atlantic provinces or maritime provinces are probably best positioned. They've been hit light, least hard by the virus, um, and or you know they're they're not an oil producer, and or they're in the better fiscal position. And again, before this ever happened, and and I'm saying this not just because I'm talking to a BC audience, we we had long been of the view that BC had the best medium term prospects for a variety of reasons. Um, you know whether whether it's the fiscal situation, whether it's the underlying um, uh, industry breakdown in BC. Um, for a variety of reasons, we we just believe BC has the best medium-term growth, and we still believe that. Uh, we, you know, not, nothing in this current episode has really changed our view. We do we do think BC is is likely to come out of this better than pretty much every other province in in the country. The the only other one I could possibly point to would be PEI, and of course they're too small to really even uh, spend much time on. Um, so so I do think BC will will come out better than than others, but still. You know, no, no two ways about it. That you know, five and a half percent decline or so in the economy this year, you know, off the charts compared to what we've seen in the past. Uh, we do think the economy in BC could grow by up, upwards of seven percent next year, but you know, when you go through the arithmetic, that that still leaves us on a per capita basis below where we were at uh, at the start of two, 2020. So it's it's still got some wood to chop, you know, even even by the end of uh, of, of next year. But you know, as I said, I like its industry breakdown. I like the uh, I like the demographics, and I, and I like the fiscal situation of of BC. I think uh, all those things uh, stand in relatively good stead. Well, I don't think that you're going to get too much uh, pushback in uh, uh, positive thoughts about BC, um, given the uh, given the participants today. And of course, we would have loved to have you in person, Doug, to uh, continue to enjoy BC and, and specifically the Okanagan Valley. Um, and so maybe there's a kind of a related qu- question there. We've got a couple of comments about immigration. Um, so a question from Mike Jacobs. Thanks for the question, Mike. So immigration has fueled housing demand in greater Vancouver with spillover effects to the Okanagan. Uh, 
Will immigration continue as COVID lockdown diminishes? So that's something I cannot answer definitively. Um, and, and by the way, I should have mentioned right off the, uh, the, the bat, um, our uh, weekly publication focus, which comes out Friday afternoons, um, uh, we've uh, one one of my uh, one of my co- colleagues has actually written a piece this week on the uh, the real estate outlook more broadly in uh, in in Canada. I can't say he comes to any definitive conclusions, but it's he makes a lot of good points and you know some of the positive and negative factors to uh, to consider when we look out a year. And and he does address immigration. Um, our our core view is that we are we are likely to go back. Um, when we get out in the 2021, uh, we, we suspect the door is still going to be fairly open in, in Canada. We don't see a dramatic change in, in government policy on that front. Uh, I can't, again, I can't say that definitively, but I don't, I don't think there's going to be a drastic change. Um, having said that, you know, one, one of the reasons why immigration had been so strong in recent years was, was the student uh, factor. Uh, we don't know if that's really going to continue to the same extent when we get it in the, in the next year, um, you know, there might just not be as many students who want to actually, uh, you know, travel abroad in, in the years ahead. So that, that factor might lighten up a little bit. We'll, uh, we'll have to see on, on that front. I, I'm, I'm of the view that the government policy is, is probably not going to change that much. I, I, I think it will still be a relatively open door. I don't, I, I doubt we're going to have population growth get back up to that one and a half percent powerful trend that we saw just before uh, the virus uh, happened. I, I, my best guess is we're, we're probably looking at something more subdued out in 2021, 22, probably more on the order of about one, one percent or maybe a little bit above that. I don't think we're going to get quite the same kind of robust uh, inflows that we had before. Still, still solid, um, but, but a, a little less frothy than what we saw in uh, 2018 and 2019. That would be my best guess. So I, I still think it's a supportive factor for, for real estate overall, just not the overwhelmingly strong factor that it, that it had been. And, and by the way, just, just as a brief reminder, if, if we go back you know, two, three months ago, um, we, we actually do believe that the Canadian housing market was coiling for a very strong year this year based on fundamentals, based on the, uh, based on the kind of population growth we were looking at as well. And really what this, this has done is it's, of course, you know, basically knocked the, the froth right out, right out of the market completely. But we think it's going to leave us with a better balanced market in, uh, when, when the dust settles. You know? So instead of being a, you know, an outright seller's market, um, which it likely was shaping up to be, and certainly in Toronto and Montreal and probably Vancouver as well, uh, we think it's probably what we're left with is a much better balanced market, in, uh, as, as I said, when the dust settles in 2021. Yeah, and we were, we were seeing the same things in the Okanagan with a very positive start to uh, the new year, uh, of course, until uh, you know, the last six weeks. And um, so on, on real estate and on, and on how banks are viewing real estate at this point, um, what impact do you see or would you, would you predict in terms of uh, bank financing for projects? And would there be particular types of uh, asset classes that would be either impacted the most or more advantageous in the eyes of a financial institution. Yeah. And I think on, on that front, it's, it's fairly intuitive. And, and, and by the way, I, I am an economist, not, not a banker. Um, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. Uh, so I'm not necessarily speaking, uh, you know, on, on behalf of bank of material on, uh, when, when we get into, into the banking, but from my perspective, um, you know, from what I understand, we're, we're, we're still doing deals across asset classes, but you know, the, the structure of the deals are, are, are a bit tighter and, and pricing is, is going to be a bit higher, partly because of the higher costs of, of funds that, uh, that Canadian banks are, are facing. Um, in terms of uh, by, by sector, um, you know, I think it's, it's fairly clear that uh, that retail and office, uh, we, we were probably being a bit more selective about those sectors in any event, even before this. And, you know, if, if anything, uh, we, we'd, we'd likely be even a little bit more careful, especially on, on, the, on the retail side uh, looking forward. Still a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of questions on, um, on, on the retail side. I, I think, you know, frankly, Ottawa is still trying to get it just right in terms of uh, the rental support. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the deal that was brought out last, uh, last week, I was, I was actually shocked when I heard the, the finance minister Morneau say it was going to cost about 2 billion. Um, you know, I, I thought it was the, the kind of help that they were looking at was, was, you know, 
was was going to be many multiples of that, and I think ultimately that 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 is going to be you know what's what's re- required here because to me that's that's the one thing that Ottawa really hasn't completely addressed properly yet is uh, is is this issue of of commercial rent, especially among uh, among some of the smaller players. But I know my uh, I know our bankers would want us to, to to tell you that you know we are we are we are still definitely open for business and. Uh, you know, and and we we do face some constraints, but uh, but you know it's uh, um, they they are, they are still doing deals, and and I and I think that's uh, one of the main messages they want me to give you. Well, I'm sure they'd be pleased with that plug, so uh, that's good. Um, now, just sort of related, so do you you would think then you touched on that, but uh, would you be projecting that spreads would be increasing, just kind of given the additional risks perceived in the near or medium term? That's that's the way I would interpret it. Now, you know the other thing. You know, of course, uh, bank funding costs have been pushed around a lot in the last couple of months. They've you know been subject as well to, you know, some of these wild swings that we've seen in uh, in financial markets. And you know, I was just looking at it the uh, just the other day in terms of even if we broaden it out and talk about U.S. mortgage rates, they had still not come down to all time lows because, you know, the the, the cost of, uh, of of funds had had not completely reflected. Uh, you know what, what's been going on in, in government yields, and you know all these things are, are basically part of the same the same dynamic where we we have seen corporate spreads or credit spreads widen out uh, since uh, since the crisis uh, be, began. Now they, they've come in from the extremes that we saw when uh, when markets were under extreme stress um, back in uh, back in mid March. Um, but they're still higher than they were before the, uh, the the crisis began, and that that's really being reflected in uh, in, a, in a lot of uh, in a lot of pricing and, and a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of interest costs that uh, that we see. You know, it's it's one thing to talk about you know extremely low government borrowing costs, but unfortunately that that uh, hasn't been fully passed on to uh, to business borrowers uh, just because uh, because the credit spreads have uh, have widened since the crisis began. Um, I want to get to a question from Sheldon Walansky and um, one of your slides uh, near the end, uh, wondering about the rationale uh, behind the flight to industrial and rural real estate post COVID. Yeah, and uh, that, that, I, I, I would imagine some of you probably find that uh, point very debatable. Um, so, so there's two separate issues there. If, if we talk about rural real, real estate, I guess we're almost thinking of the, the possibility that you know, in a world where it's much more acceptable to uh, to work from home, um, you know, you got a lot more social distancing possibly, which goes on for who knows, maybe years. Um, there, there might just be, you know, some people lying up, uh, you know, the, who who may have felt they they had to work within an easy commute or not, you know, may, maybe more willing to uh, to live in the exurbs or even in in rural locales. Now, you know, we we, we see this more at at the margin. Uh, we don't think there's going to be a tremendous shift in uh, in that direction, but you know, for for some smaller locations, uh, even even a small increase in demand could uh, could really have an influence on on prices. In terms of the industrial real estate, we're we're using a, a rather general term there. We're we're including warehousing in that, and uh, we we do think there's there's going to be a lot more. Uh, push to to hold h- higher inventories. Uh, we also, you know, as as part of the uh, the increasing trend towards uh, online shopping, e-commerce, we, uh, we you know we think there's a, a lot more demand for for warehousing space. But even on the industrial side, you know, this goes back to the the comments I was making before that ultimately, you know, one thing we could see is a is a, is a you know some of those supply chains moving to back to North America. Uh, again, it, it might just be at the margin that we're talking about, not, nothing dramatic by any means. Um, but it is, it is possible that, uh, you know, an ultimate winner from this uh, could be a little bit more demand for, uh, for industrial space. But, but there we are referring more to, uh, to warehouses. It, 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 gets, uh, it gets captured in, under the industrial uh, uh, moniker, at least in, in the way we look at it. Makes sense. Um, so I think, you know, we've got a few more minutes here and I might just pull back just for a couple more broader questions and kind of leave you with uh, more of a crystal ball question, of course, uh, to finish things off. But um, are, are negative interest rates a possibility in the short term or the midterm? term? 
So it's interesting. Before all this began, um, I, I did used to get that question a lot. And I used to say, yes, it's definitely a possibility because the Bank of Canada has told us it's a possibility. Um, about four years ago, uh, Governor Polis gave a speech where he very clearly uh, said that, you know, during the financial crisis, the bank thought the lowest they could take interest rates is where they are now and where they got to in the, the last financial crisis at 0.25%. But the, the bank had had a rethink, and they thought that, uh, no, in fact, uh, their interest rate could go as low as minus a half a percent in, in a real emergency situation. Well, arguably, what we went through in March is, you know, about as emergency as it gets, and the bank slowly uh, took rates down to 0.25%. And uh, Mr. Pohl, is, I think he's had another change of heart, um, and, and it's based on the experience of negative interest rates in Europe and Japan, and I think... The experience there has not been great. And, um, you know, when, when Polos gave that speech a number of years ago, you know, we didn't have a lot of experience with negative rates in Europe. And now that they've seen what's happened in the last four or five years, I think they've decided that really doesn't work. There, you know, there's as many downsides as upsides to, to negative rates. And I think that's absolutely the last tool that they would use. I, I you know, I, I, I wouldn't rule it out, but uh, Polos is, I, I think he's been a, about as clear as, as he possibly could be that they really don't want to go there. They're, they're, there's lots of other things that they would do before we, uh, we got into negative rates. I, 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 the, the one scenario where I could see them possibly considering negative interest rates is if we get into a situation where inflation is, is negative year after year. You know, and I don't mean just temporarily because of a decline in oil prices. I mean, you know, all prices are, are falling. Um, you know, and we have outright deflation. Then I could see them getting into, uh, you know, where, where they would consider negative interest rates. But we're, we're a long way from, from that. So I, I don't believe we're, we're, we're going there. Likewise, the Fed is, uh, if anything, they've been even more clear on, on this, that they're, they're not interested in, uh, in the going to negative interest rates. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I um, just want to be respectful, of course, of your time and, and the time uh, of the attendees. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap things up with a final question here. And uh, there's been I mean, a number of questions just sort of related to the time and what things look like in, in the short term in terms of how the recovery is framed. And, and I think I'll take uh, on this Kevin Johnson's question, which, which is, um, I'll read it here. So consumer confidence index and custom, or consumer spending are key measures we look at in our market. It's obviously gone down substantially right now, but how fast or how long does it typically take for the index to move and normalize? Is this pause different than a typical recession? And I guess the other way to frame that too could be, you know, how long until we start seeing that confidence come back into the market? So there, there's no question that uh, we, we can't really draw on a lot of historical precedents for this because it is, is such an unusual situation. Um, you know, in, in some ways, when you think of all the crises we've been through in the last 30 years, this had elements of every one of them wrapped up into one. Um, you know, even, you know, you can even draw some parallels to 9-11, you know, in, in just in terms of how we had almost a full stop in, uh, in travel. Um, but I will talk about 9-11 just in, in one aspect to, it, to address the question. Uh, you know, when, when we look at what happened to U.S. air travel after 9-11, it, it took almost four years for air travel in the U.S. to get back to pre-9-11 days. Um, now, a lot of things happened in the years after 9-11, including the invasion of Iraq, and you know the tech wreck was in full flight at, at that point. So it's, it's not a perfect example, but it gives you an idea how long it took consumers to, to you know, get back to, quote, normal. Uh, I don't know, know that it's necessarily going to take four years, but it could take a couple years before things are, are really back to, 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 quote, normal th this time as well. The big offset is um, we, we've, we've had just, as I said, tremendous fiscal support from Ottawa and Washington. You know, yeah, we've had a big decline in income, but they've really offset that to a large extent. And, um, you know, I, I think probably every individual on the call can think about their own particular situation. And in a lot of cases, uh, or, or at least you know somebody who, you know, who's spending very little and yet, you know, in some way or another income is still coming in the door. And what we're seeing is savings rates are actually going up on, uh, for the economy as a whole during this episode. And so we think consumers actually will come out of this in reasonable shape, supported by government spending. And 
you know, we, we could see uh, there's going to be a lot of pent up demand for goods. I can name haircuts for one thing um, where, where people are going to come back pretty, uh, pretty quickly in some ways. Uh, other ways, you know, as I said, things like restaurant and travel, that's, that's a tougher road. That's, that's going to take longer to, to turn around. Um, some, some industries are, are going to face a really long workout and others, others will be, I think, back to, to quote normal quite quickly. So, uh, you know, that's quite a mis- mixed message, but I think the, you know, the main point is, is, uh, uh it, it it's 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 going to take a while to recover fully, but 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 I think uh, consumer spending will will come back pretty strongly in uh, in 2021 overall. Well, thanks, Doug. I mean, you know, I had to ask a question about uh, how long and how quickly, and I'm sure you've been asked that before. So I appreciate that, and uh, I think that about wraps up our our time here. So um, I'll just uh, move to kind of our info here, and I'll hop back on. I just want to. Uh, just want to share our thanks on behalf of UDI to Douglas Porter for joining us and taking the time out of his busy schedule to share some, uh, some very pertinent and, uh, and relevant information for us during this time. Um, just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we, uh, we've recorded the event and the slides will be posted to our website and you'll be able to get information there as well. Um, and I also encourage them to contact uh, the UDI office if they have other uh, event topics they'd like to see. And I also see uh, a hand raised from our chair, uh, Rich. And so I'm just going to, Rich, are you there? That was just an accident. So sorry. No, I, I just, as, as the chair, Rich, I couldn't say no to uh, allowing you to speak. It's, it's, uh, it's part of the proper protocol, I think. But uh, at any rate, you've got our information there. Uh, thanks again to all the attendees. And of course, thank you to Doug as our speaker for joining us. And uh, please look out for our events. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.